happy holidays, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Christy Grayson, and I am the nutritional health coach here at our Monument location on Baptist Road. Today, we're going to look at ways to take gluten-free cooking to the next level this holiday season. So whether you're brand new to gluten-free cooking or you're a novice gluten-free baker, we're here to give you some tips and tricks so that you can utilize these tips and tricks to impress your friends and family with how delicious gluten-free eating can be. Before we begin, this class is not intended to diagnose, treat, or mitigate any disease. Dietary supplements and foods can interact with prescription medications, so it's really important for you to become um, familiar with the possible interactions if you currently take any prescriptions. As a family-owned business, we still operate from these five founding principles of nutrition education, high quality standards, uh, everyday affordable pricing, supporting our local communities, and supporting our great employees. One I'd like to highlight today is committed to everyday affordable pricing. We believe that good health and nutrition is a right and should be available and affordable to everyone. This is why we always pass on our savings to our customers. Today, we're gonna to be discussing the following. What is a grain? What are some reasons to consider avoiding them by looking at their nutrient density, the carb impact on health, and the proteins that are included in them. Next, we're gonna discuss how to plan grain-free meals. We'll also share some recipe ideas for the holidays, and Don will wrap up today's presentation with a holiday treat. The term grain refer, refers to the fruit and seed of domesticated grasses. Here we have a list of grains and pseudo grains that you're probably already familiar with. And just to note, GF stands for gluten-free grains. Let's take a moment to look at the anatomy of a grain. The bran or the outside part of the grain protects the seed. It is a source of fiber, B vitamins, and minerals. However, those minerals are bound with something called phytic acid, which makes them difficult to absorb. The endosperm is mainly made up of starches, which is a carbohydrate. The proteins in the endosperm are storage proteins and are difficult to digest and can be allergenic. The germ is the reproductive part that germinates and grows into a new plant. It's the embryo of the seed. It's also the source of nutrients in the grain, but the nutrients can be difficult to absorb and are not in great enough quantity to meet the body's nutrient needs to utilize the carbs, the endosperm, um, the carbs in the endosperm for energy. It's also important to note that when grains are processed to make flour, for example, that the bran and the germ are removed, leaving mainly carbs. One study evaluating food groups for 13 vitamins and minerals most commonly deficient in the American diet found that grains ranked very low for nutrient density. And you can see these foods listed in order of rank um, on the right side of the screen. Because whole grains and milk maintain the next to lowest nutrient uh, density rankings, the displacement of fruit and veggies, lean meats, and seafood by these two staple food groups lowers the overall micronutrient density in the diet. In addition to these 13 vitamins and minerals, grains are also lower in fat soluble vitamins like A, D, E, and K, in addition to essential amino acids and essential fatty acids. And just to note that essential means that the body cannot make them and they must be taken in through food or supplementation. Best sources of these include animal products, nuts and seeds, and veggies. Vitamin A supports eye, skin, mucous membrane, and immune system health. Nutrient dense sources of vitamin A include organ meats like beef and lamb liver, 
cod liver oil, fish like salmon, tuna, and trout, cheese, and butter. And while the grains um, contain beta carotene, the conversion from beta carotene to retinol in the body is inefficient for many people. Vitamin D is important for brain, um, brain, immune, bone, cardiovascular, muscle, prostate, and breast health. It also supports healthy blood sugar levels and modulates inflammation. Up to 74% of Americans may be deficient in vitamin D, which makes obtaining this important vitamin very, very important, especially in the winter months when we're not outside and our skin is not as exposed to the sun as much. Or if you are outside, the angle of the sun is such that it makes it difficult for us to produce as much vitamin D in the winter time. So we wanna be sure that we're either supplementing getting it from food um, and making sure that we know where our vitamin D level is anyway. So nutrient dense sources can include whole eggs, fatty cold water fish like salmon, swordfish, trout, tuna and halibut, and cod liver oil. Vitamin E is our main fat soluble antioxidant. It, is, it supports immune, cardiovascular, circulatory, hormonal, liver, eye, and nerve health. It's important to remember the refining of grains actually strips them of the valuable vitamin E inside of them. Nutrient-dense sources that we can focus on in our diet include sunflower seeds, nuts like almonds, pine nuts, and hazelnuts, fish, and olive oil. There are two forms of vitamin K called K1 and K2. Vitamin K1 supports healthy blood clotting and vitamin K2 supports bone and cardiovascular health, healthy blood sugar, cell growth and replication. All grain products are naturally low in vitamin K. Nutrient dense sources in our diet include K1 would be collards, kale, spinach, turnip greens, and K2 includes grass-fed butter, aged and fermented cheese, whole eggs, and organ meats like liver. Essential amino acids are needed for growth and repair and to make all structures in the body. They also support healthy neurotransmitter production, hormonal and immune health, and digestion. Best food sources include whole eggs, whey protein, and animal source proteins. Essential fatty acids support cell membrane health, healthy inflammation, and utilization of hormones and neurotransmitters. They are also important for eye, brain, and joint health. Food sources include fatty cold water fish like salmon, herring, and sardines. So why should we consider avoiding grains? Grains are not only lower in nutrients, but they're also carb dense. A study examining nutrient density of 95 carbohydrate rich foods found that cereal foods, including rice and pasta, were among the least nutrient dense foods. Refined cereal foods ranked similar to cookies and pastries. Additionally, refined and whole grains had high glycemic index scores, indicating both have a greater ability to raise blood sugar. The highest glycemic index scores included brown and white rice, refined and whole grain breads, pastas, and breakfast cereals. It's important to take into consideration the impact that grains can have on our blood sugar. It's vital to keep our blood sugar in the green or normal range, as indicated in this chart, with gentle increases and decreases as we eat throughout the day. This gives the cells that require sugar enough to function, but not so much that sugar can damage our bodies. Too much sugar can negatively impact 
our health. Although our body utilizes glucose or sugar for energy, it can only take so much. When we eat carbs, including grains, they break down quickly and dump a large amount of sugar into the blood all at once, which causes a blood sugar spike. High blood sugar is stressful for our body, increasing pro-inflammatory molecules and damaging body proteins. It increases mood swings and brain fog due to inflammation. Insulin, a hormone released by the pancreas, works to keep blood sugar from staying too high for too long by helping to get the sugar out of the blood and into the cells for energy. Any excess is packed away as fat storage. This is why an increase in blood sugar leads to an increase in fat storage. Insulin does its job and blood sugar drops. But because the amount of insulin released is in proportion to how fast blood sugar rises, there can be so much insulin released that the blood sugar drops below the grain zone. Low blood sugar is also stressful for, for the body. So we release hormones to try to correct the imbalance. Cortisol, commonly known as a stress hormone, also has the ability to help increase our blood sugar. However, sustained increased levels can cause gut damage. It can also lead to cravings. You know, those sweet, salty, caffeine, processed foods that we, that we can be drawn to. Fatigue and brain fog are all likely at the bottom of that roller coaster. So we want balanced blood sugar and balanced insulin levels. We need some insulin to support growth and healing, but too much can lead to a wide range of health issues. That include things like an increase in fat storage and an inability to burn stored fat for energy, blood, an increase in blood pressure, an increase in cell proliferation, increased production of amyloid proteins in, in brain and the re, in reduced ability to degrade and clear those amyloid proteins from the brain, and an increase in inflammation. Balanced carbohydrate intake supports balanced blood sugar, which leads to balanced insulin. Grains contain problematic proteins that can damage health. Prolam uh, prolamins are proteins that include a sequence of amino acids that are found in grains and legumes that are not easily digested. And as you can see at the bottom left, there are a list of different grains like wheat, oats, barley, and their respective prolamin protein names. All grains, even pseudograins, have prolamins. And the pseudograins you'll remember would be things like quinoa. So why are prolamins problematic? Well, we don't have the enzymes to break these proteins down. And therefore, the protein fragments stay intact in the intestinal lumen. This can be cause for concern as they can create cytotoxins, which can create cell damage or death. It can activate the immune system, open tight junctions in our gut, that, which then in turn can increase permeability in our gut, allowing undigested food particles into the bloodstream. So to recap that whole process, the prolamin proteins in grains activate a gut immune reaction which can increase inflammation in the gut and possibly cause damage to the gut lining, which increases the permeability of our gut lining, allowing undigested proteins to enter the bloodstream, further creating an immune reaction to the quote, foreign particles. The breakdown in the tight junctions within our gut can be short-lived and your immune system may be able to handle the influx of gut contents limiting the negative effect, but chronic damage to the gut can increase gut permeability for longer periods and can lead to leaky gut syndrome. There are a variety of factors that can lead to leaky gut syndrome, like an overexposure to gluten and the prolamin proteins from grains in conjunction with lifestyle, genetic, and environmental factors. Um, 
Lifestyle and environmental factors include things like um, a decreased amount of fiber in the diet, infections like H. pylori, stress, gut microbiota dysbiosis or an imbalance of the microbiome in the gut, chronic alcohol consumption, a decrease in your vitamin D levels, and genetic concerns like autoimmunity. In individuals with a genetic predisposition, a leaky gut may allow environmental factors to enter the body and trigger the in initiation and development of autoimmune disease. When the gut is leaky, anything in the gut can enter the blood. This causes multiple chemical sensitivities, additional food sensitivities can emerge, and even autoimmunity. Overall, damage to the gut opens the door for the development of autoimmune conditions. Autoimmune disorders occur when, um, when the immune system malfunctions and attacks the body's own tissues and organs causing damage. Some examples of auto autoimmune conditions can uh, include things like type one diabetes, multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, and even celiac disease. So let's talk for a moment about how celiac disease um, kind of unfolds in this process. The development of celiac disease involves the complex interplay between these three factors. One, the ingestion of an environmental trigger like the gluten prolamins. Two, a genetic predisposition. And three, increased intestinal permeability, also known very similarly to leaky gut. So, Celiac, people who have celiac are unable to digest gluten. The intestinal cells of these individuals see it as an invader. The intestinal cells release chemicals to ramp up the immune response to fight the invasion. Gluten creates a more permeable gut, a permeable gut like leaky gut with undigested proteins inside the gut walls. Therefore, the attack does damage to the villi because it's not intended to be happening inside. And the villi are responsible for absorbing our nutrients from the foods we eat. So you can see how this would be a problem. In the end, the result of gluten ingestion is damaged tissue and malabsorption, often accompanied by the familiar cramping, diarrhea, and bloating symptoms, as well as lingering leaky gut syndrome. Even without autoimmunity, leaky gut can have consequences for everyone. Some non-gut related issues that we can find are migraines, muscle and joint pain, fatigue, food sensitivities, cognitive problems, mood imbalances, skin problems, and nutrient deficiencies. And this is because the gut interacts with the whole body um, in addition to 70, at least 60 to 80% of our uh, immune system is in our gut. Chronic symptoms of constipation, bloating and gas, diarrhea, heartburn, stomach pain and nausea are likely your body telling you that your digestion is off and to pay attention. So to recap, consider these reasons for avoiding grains their nutrient density, the poor nutrient density, the high amount of carbohydrates that can negatively affect your blood sugar, and the immune activating proteins that can damage our health. So if we don't eat grains, what can we eat? Aim to model your plate, breakfast, lunch, dinner, after our healthy meal wheel pictured here to the right. You wanna make sure that you fill half your plate with those yummy vegetables of all colors, about a palm size of quality protein, considering what the animal was fed, some good healthy fats, uh, additional carbs, more so from starchy vegetables, like your sweet potatoes, um, some of your squash family, beets, and then use fruit as a sweet treat. So let's take a moment we wanna give you some inspiring holiday meal ideas. And there are all kinds 
of, um, of favorites, right? Like bread, rolls, stuffing, crackers, sauces, gravies, and they're all filled, most of them, with grain flours like all-purpose flour, whole wheat, pastry, bread, and cake flour. So as some alternatives, try experimenting and switching some of these flours out for things like coconut flour, nut flours, tapioca flour, cassava flour, and arrowroot flour. It's important to remember to consume alternative flours in moderation. It's not meant to replace grains as the staple of the diet. Any food consumed in excess can be harmful to our body. Grains, nuts, seeds, and legumes are still high in phytates too. These anti-nutrients can bind to minerals like calcium, magnesium, potassium, and zinc, making them unavailable to be absorbed by the gut. An excess consumption of these phytate-rich foods can cause mineral deficiencies, which can lead to issues like dental and bone health and delayed growth in children. Proper preparation of the grains, nuts and seeds, and legumes can decrease phytates, making those nutrients in them a little more available. Traditional practices for decreasing the phytates include things like soaking, sprouting, and fermenting. And these methods promote digestibility and decrease phytates, including overall nutrient quality. Some preparation methods include soaking. You want to soak the grain, nut, or bean, seed, or even the seeds, usually overnight. Sprouting involves several cycles of soaking, rinsing, and draining, which causes some germination or the physical sprouts to actually start to grow and appear. And beyond 12 to 24 hours of soaking, fermentation is going to begin. Um, a tip on the flowers, if you want to soak those, simply combine the flour and the liquid called for in the recipe and let it soak overnight. We have some excellent resources in the store that can also help you with this process. Uh, one of my favorites is Sally Fallon, her book called Nourishing Traditions. She gives a lot of great tips on this process too. So here are a few recipe ideas. If one catches your eye, just check out our downloadable recipes that are accompanying this class um, after the class. So, and I am only going to go over some of the um, ideas for you on what to try. Um, you can kind of look back and think what not like what we already do, right? The breads, the crackers, the gravies, the potatoes. But for our appetizers, make sure um, that you put out lots of veggies. You can actually make veggie chips. You can make things like the Parmesan crisp. And you can use different alternatives for crackers like made from sunflower and sesame instead of whole wheat. On the veggies and sides, you can do a grain-free herb gravy. Um, and there are lots of great recipes out there. Cauliflower mashed potatoes instead of potatoes. Garlic and bacon Brussels sprouts, healthy sweet potato casserole, all kinds of different additions that you can do uh, that will make you feel like you're eating a little bit of a healthier meal. So what about the breads and desserts? I'll admit they're my favorite part. So try these yummy options instead. Some grain-free biscuits or gluten-free buns, making some uh, grain or bread-free dressing and using uh, vegetables in your dressing instead of the bread. An almond flour bread uh, can be nice. On the dessert side, researching some paleo pecan pie, um, spiced apple compote. Um, there's just so many different recipes and we've included so many different recipes with this class. Um, there are some really great desserts that you can um, incorporate this season. So keep them a treat. Try grain-free alternatives so that you still feel like you're getting a treat. So just to recap, because we've covered a lot today, number one, grains are carb dense, lower in nutrients, and can negatively affect our blood sugar, insulin, and our health. They contain proteins that can trigger our immune system response. By eliminating grains from your holiday and everyday meals, you, um, it can be easy and can support optimal health. 
And we have lots of resources to help you if you want to know more about this process within the digestion system and how grains can impact our health. And this middle book right here is the Sally Fallon book that I was referring to, Nourishing Traditions. We also have some amazing cookbooks. Practical Paleo is definitely one of my favorites. She has a lot of great recipes in there, um, but we have a ton um, available for you. And so without further ado, I'm gonna pass our presentation on to Dawn. She's gonna wrap things up with a special holiday treat. That was a great presentation, lots of great information, and great ideas about eating grain free and then you can try it in the morning. Um, that's actually one of the things I've done over the couple of years is convert a lot of my old recipes into uh, grain free recipes and almond flour works really well for a lot of those things that you enjoy. Almond flour works really well for muffins and cookies and make um, shortbread um, sugar cookies with almond flour. And today I'm gonna to show you how to make an almond flour pie crust. Um, that's kind of one of the tricky parts. You can use a lot of the other nut flours too, like hazelnut flour or even walnuts can work great for pie crust. But I decided to just show you a really simple one um, that's easy to make and tastes really good. The recipe that I gave you um, is on the baking with almond flour recipe. And it's the no grain pie crust that I'm going to so I am using our natural grocer's blanched almond flour that we sell in our bulk. And I think Christy mentioned that almonds do, I mean, nuts do have some phytic acid in them. So sprouting them definitely helps. Um, but with almonds, the outside of the almond, the dark part of the almond has a lot of the phytic acid. So if they're blanched and that outer part is removed, you can avoid a lot of the phytic acid and still get a tasty flour to use for baking. So I'm going to use almond flour and it only requires two cups of almond flour even, uh, and then a quarter teaspoon of salt, which I'm going to use um, our real salt from our bulk. And then I'm also going to use coconut oil. You're welcome to use coconut oil or ghee or butter. Um, either one works. And also eggs. Uh, Natural Grocers has a really high quality has really quite high quality standards on their eggs. And they're also at affordable prices. They're at the very least $1.99, so very affordable. And like these eggs here are local farm fresh, but they also meet our standards for being um, pre-range and either non-GMO or organic. So let me go ahead and get started with making this pie crust. For this recipe, we're gonna do two cups of almond flour. So got one cup here, another cup. Almond flour can be a little bit lumpy. And so you can either sift your almond flour or just make sure that you're just kind of taking a little bit of extra time to stir that almond flour and get the extra lumps out. And I will admit, I tried um, to do this recipe earlier and I forgot that you actually don't want to bake it as long as it says. It says to bake the pie crust for 12 to 15 minutes. And I think it's best to bake it for only about 10 minutes um, because you, then you put a filling in and you've got to bake it even more. And almonds can burn kind of easily. So um, really what makes this pie crust even easier to make is you're only cooking it for about 10 minutes. So you mix together your, your almond flour and your salt. You need about a quarter teaspoon of salt. I like to use either Himalayan sea salt or the real salt because it actually still has minerals in it. So they're both healthy to kind of balance out the sodium and the vitamins have other minerals in there. So kind of stir that up and make sure you get all the lumps out and mix the salt together with the almond flour. And then we're just going to need, I think it's just one egg. One egg, and we're going to need just a little bit of um, coconut oil. I use coconut oil, but again, if you want, like maybe a buttery tasting crust, you can use butter or you can use ghee. 
Gi is clarified better in case you haven't worked with Gi before. Um, so when better is clarified, it removes all the dairy solids. So if you are allergic to dairy, you can do um, dairy. You probably might still be able to do Gi because the lactose and um, other milk solids are removed. So I'm throwing in a tablespoon of coconut oil and then another tablespoon of coconut oil. Coconut oil is a great healthy fat. It's great for our immune system. It's great to work with in baking. Um, it's a lot healthier than so or shortening, right? And it is kind of a similar consistency. You kind of just cut in your fat, your coconut oil in with, with your egg. Heat those together. Cut the coconut oil. You don't want to melt your fat. You want to keep it solid. It helps to kind of maybe set it out on the, the counter or the stove so it gets a little bit soft, but you don't want to melt it so that it still can cut in the flour. So once you've got that mixed up together, then you can combine your flour and your egg and coconut oil mixture. So I'm mixing all that together and then I'm just going to, and this is where it takes a little bit of time. Actually. It takes a little bit of time to stir this together and get it worked together. Um, Almond flour is different from regular flour, right? You kind of have to get used to working with it, but you put a little muscle in to get this mixed up really well. So it takes a little bit of time to mix in. You do want to grease your, your pie plate, which I have previously cut my pie plate, coconut oil, or you could use a natural shortening, but we have a natural grocery, so you don't create a hydrogenated shortening. Um, hydrogenated, hydrogenated oils are one of the worst things to put in your heart. While coconut oil is actually heart healthy, it's really good for supporting healthy cell levels. Although I will say that some people are sensitive to coconut oil, not everyone grabs cell and some people it does not Just a side Once you get that pie crust really kind of smashed together, you can actually start cooking on a ball. And it does take a little bit of time to really get it soft and consistent. You can also use my knife. Once you get it together, you can form it into a ball like so. You can then press it into your pie crust and your pie pan and, and then press it on. It takes a little bit of time. And it's a little hard to hear you. Okay, I'm going to speak up and see if you can hear me. <laughs> I will show you like the end product because it does take a, time, a little bit of time to get this mixed together. Let me show you what it looks like when it's mixed together and I'll show you a, a finished pie, okay? Can you hear me a little bit better now? Am I speaking better? Is it louder? Yes, it's louder. So like I said, it does take a little bit of time to work with that pie. Don't give up. You can get it to roll into a ball. And once it does, it'll kind of come out. It's just kind of like almost like a veto. It comes out like a veto like this. And then you can press that into your pie press or your pie pan. And then you're going to bake that pie. Once you're done baking the, the pie um, press, then you can fill it with whatever you want. I did put together a pumpkin pie recipe to do a pumpkin filling. And um, I have a finished pie for you to see. So this is with our almond crust. And this is, if you want to get the recipe, it has the pumpkin pie filling that we have in there. The pumpkin pie filling is technically dairy free as well. You used canned coconut milk instead of condensed dairy milk. So it is dairy free, dairy free. Thanks for uh, posting that pumpkin ice. 
healing recipe. And I think that's all for me on making a grain-free pumpkin pie crust. I hope you enjoyed. Have fun playing around with this. And um, I hope it's one of your new holiday favorites. Thank you, Don and Christy. It was informative, and now I want some pumpkin pie. <laughs> Are there any questions at all before we um, end? And as I said, I will email out the handouts um, in a little bit after we finish up. Okay, it doesn't look like we have any questions. So thank you again, Don and Christy, for the information and the recipe demo. Thank you. Good job, Christy. You did great. Thank you.